What? Tag Heuer? Tag Heuer, yeah. Say it however you want. Tag Heuer. going to judge okay. you for it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, this is Eleanor from Revolution. I am here in Paris in the presidential suite of the Lutetia with Nicolas Boubank, who happens to be the heritage director at Tag Eur, I'm gonna say it the French way. He's been in this position for now a year and a half and he's got a lot of things to say. Starting with the fact that you went from an auction house to a collector to being solely passionate about collectibles from cars to motorbikes to bicycle and now into watches. How did you become such a person and personality in that industry? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, well, thank you very much for having me to start off first of all. But for me, uh, the fascination has always been around engineering, design, uh, what the position is of these objects within kind of wider culture. And when I was young, uh, I think a few people will know now that I come from a very modest background and uh, my father was passionate about these uh, cars and motorcycles in particular. And we uh, would pack our lunch at six o'clock in the morning, make our sandwiches, and then we would go to Goodwood or Silverstone. Or one year we went to Le Mans together and kind of slept by the side of the road on the way down. And uh, to see these objects, to see these you know, pieces of art, these pieces of machinery, moving and doing their thing, uh, it's, it's really magical and I feel that a lot of this is fairly underappreciated in the wider sense. People have a perception around what a car enthusiast is, what a watch enthusiast is. For me it's much, much broader than that. You can look at a fantastic painting, you can look at an amazing piece of jewellery, uh, you can read a beautiful book, you can hear amazing music. It's all coming from the same place, you know, this human emotion that uh, creates these things. And, you know, from that as a, a root cause, it was very easy for me to uh, expand into these uh, these different facets, these different understandings, and uh, and kind of grow from there. But yeah, I mean, going back to the beginning at auction, it was uh, uh, an interesting thing. Uh, many of my friends were going into law or finance and uh, said to me, "You're, You're crazy. crazy. <laughs> You're completely insane. You know, why are you doing something where there's no money?" You know, I had to decide between buying lunch or paying my train fare at the end of the month because I was being paid so little. But I just kind of felt that if I was doing what I loved and trying to share this with other people that one day it might work out and I was young, I could take the risk. So, uh, and What was the, the most interesting thing that you learned working in an auction house as opposed to now being inside a brand? I think probably one of the most valuable experiences is this idea of having a direct relationship with the client. Um, as a brand it's very easy for you to be in the headquarters thinking that this is how consumers in China behave or this is what collectors are looking for in a watch or when we want to attract new clients this is the policy that we should follow but in actuality unless you're directly communicating with these individuals on a daily basis as I still do today I have friends in Singapore or Tokyo or Shanghai or of course Hong Kong the US all over Europe they message me every day asking questions about oh I'm thinking of buying uh, this Patek Philippe or uh, you know Richard Mille has just announced a new watch what can you tell me and when you hear this direct feedback not specific to one individual brand but to uh, the whole gamut of the watch industry and across cars and art and wine and whatever else it may be then you can really start to understand uh, what the consumer behavior is and often where they're moving because particularly at the top end of the market because they have the means to do so they can take more risks and they can kind of front run the tastes that might uh, follow later so to have this direct relationship for me is is extremely valuable and standing at the viewings at Christie's and presenting watches to clients and seeing it that way for me was really uh, really fascinating and I, I like to try and uh, bring that. I, I guess I learned the skills first of all when I was working at the Apple store in Birmingham to pay my way through university so to bring this all together has been a lot of fun. Yeah but to some, ex to some extent don't you think I mean you have to do double homework because not only you need to understand what the culture how the culture works depending on the country or the area in the world where you have the collectors and the end consumer but at the same time you need to know everything about every brand and mm -hmm. every period and every model like since you can't really extend your day how do you learn and get in that much knowledge and that many anecdotes and the extra thing going the extra mile that your competitors or somebody who can have the same title don't, I mean, he doesn't have or she doesn't have? Yeah, I mean, it's a great point that you have a limited number of hours in the day. You know, I have a young family, I'm married, I have to travel for work, uh, I drive around to get to the factory and these kind of things. There's only so much you can do. Uh, for me, it's about 
rationalizing how I've consumed news from the industry. Uh, I have a, you know, a RSS feed of various uh, publications, you know, mm -hmm. yourself, Hadinki, uh, these sorts of things, and I, I try and browse through it. Of course, luckily, the, the best of the best floats to the top. You see on Instagram, you get messages from people asking your opinion. I mean, the great example was the uh, uh, Tiffany dialed 5711. You know, the whole world was talking about this watch for, for, for weeks on end. So even if you were, you know, living on another planet with your head stuck in the ground, you would still hear about these things. So I think that that's one key component. But when you're passionate about these things, this is what you do in your, your spare time. Yeah, but your added value is that you're getting and you're getting, and that's why people are reaching out to you. And that's also probably why you became the heritage director at Tag Heuer. It's because you have that extra content, that extra information that nobody else has. And you're talking about the Tiffany dial. Did anyone ask you why Tiffany blue? Where is that coming from? Yeah, I mean, I do you think, actually have an answer to that? <laughs> well, I do not. Uh, <laughs> actually, I do. I do have one. I had, um, I mean, the, the small part that I played in it, I, w I got a call from, uh, 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 it was Frederick actually. Frederick called me up and said, we have this amazing watch coming, uh, uh, a Tiffany Patek. Um, we want to sell one for charity. Who should we speak to? I said, I'll call Earl Bax. He's the obvious guy, like, here's his number. And that was, I think, probably a contributing factor into how it ended up at Philips. But uh, yeah, I, I, when you have a situation like that, um, everyone wants the inside track, right? Everyone wants yeah. to know what's going on. But they on. also want to get the facts right. Yeah, I mean, sometimes the, uh, <laughs> the story's more interesting than the actual hard facts. Uh, I think it, it's the same with any artistic process, right? Actually seeing how the sausage is made isn't nearly as exciting as enjoying the end product. So I think it's, it's nice to lift the curtain sometimes. And for me, a great example is uh, supplier transparency. I think what uh, Max has done with MBNF uh, is really a model the for the F industry of the to MBNF, follow. The MBNF, which is the exactly, yeah. bringing and up to light. We did this with Only Watch uh, in 2021, where we said, oh, we're working with Art Time, we're working with Martinez, mm -hmm. we're working with uh, Art Time to do the finishing. I think when you can share this kind of information, it's, it's super valuable because it elevates uh, what is a luxury product. And of course, it allows you to uh, dismiss any uh, rumors about how you might be doing the manufacturing otherwise. But I still think, you know, there's an elegance to some mystery uh, within this product as well. So uh, it's uh, a bit of a mix. But yeah, I guess I've found myself at the hub of these things because I have quite a broad, broad spectrum of friends who are passionate about watches all within the industry. So. And at what point did you think or did you ever think you'd make a move from an auction house and something more general where you touch and go about different brands and different products to being not the inside mind, but the eyes and ears of like a, a key element, a key player inside a company like Tiger Air with a lot of heritage, a lot of archives and a lot of history mm. and being involved at the end in the, the creation of the product, basically creating and writing the future history of that brand. Uh, I mean, just for the sake of clarification, I'm not that directly involved in product creation. I'm really focused on the, the heritage aspects of the brand and whilst I do assist with briefing the product team from time to time when we, we have a new uh, new product coming and some of the guys on the team like to share with me any the kind of development work. I'm not, uh, you know, the chef in the kitchen mixing the ingredients. No, but you're making sure that the facts are right and there's you can bring some details and some the little thing that's going to make it, for example, right now we're here to talk about the, the new launch and the limited edition of the Porsche Carrera. I mean, the tribute to the 50th anniversary of the Porsche Carrera RS 2.7, mm. which was an iconic car when it came out and it's becoming now an, an iconic watch. What are the, I want to say, the, the biggest challenges when, you ha when you're creating such a piece with two companies that have such a big story, a big heritage, a big name, and you want to make sure that on both parties everybody's happy, but at the same time you need to make a striking product yeah. for the end consumer. So, how? What's the brief? Like, how do you? I mean, for me, uh, I mean, I can say it from both my, uh, you know, collector's standpoint and also from yeah. from working at a brand now. For me, the key thing is authenticity. You know, if you create a product like this and you're trying to come up with some uh, fictitious story that has some like ten link to uh, the two products it, it's not a real partnership um, what you need is something that is a hundred percent true all the way through because if you don't consumers will recognize it and mm -hmm. uh, and the product simply won't work I mean I think what we've created here is, is something really interesting we've taken a lot of the design codes from the 2.7 RS and uh, created something that is uh, emblematic of our relationship between Tag Heuer and Porsche now of course 
as you mentioned, we're, we're both very big organisations, there's a lot of players involved. Uh, but when the hearts and minds are all committed and everyone wants to move in the same direction, you can create something that really uh, is a distilled version mm -hmm. of everyone's feelings. And I think with Porsche we're very lucky in that sense that we spend a lot of time with the teams there, uh, we have regular calls, We, of course we have uh, a few, a small team managing the relationship directly, but for example, a few weeks ago, a large group of us went to Stuttgart to see the museum and meet with the design teams and understand what their long-term studies are in, in different markets. And with that kind of information and insight, it's really, really easy for us to work together. And of course, we've welcomed them to our museum and showed them around the factory. So it's a very uh, symbiotic and like authentic relationship. So we're really uh, lucky. So in choosing, for example, the two cars, because reading and hearing about when the Carrera was launched in 1972, two and seven are pretty big numbers because yeah. 72 was the year it was created, yeah. 2.7 is the RS model, 27 with the number of colors, sure, sure. the vivid colors that were yeah. picked uh, to, to create the different variations of, of the car back in the days. And now you've narrowed down to two, yeah. why not seven, and why blue and red? Well, the, the, the good thing there is, uh, whether it was like fortuitous or accidental or like really instilled from the beginning, it's difficult to say. But when you look at this broad spectrum of colors that they had, of course, there were lots of uh, base ones in competition white mm -hmm. with the graphics, and that's where we took the inspiration. But when you look at the red and the white, uh, sorry, the red and the blue, uh, we have codes that directly link to that. If you look at the Silverstone that was launched uh, around the same time as the 2.7 RS, we had the blue version that famously was worn by Clay Regazzoni. We had the red version, the burgundy dial. Uh, on the Carrera, we had the pulsation scale and the decimal scales in the early versions with this very similar blue uh, colorization. For the red, we had the tachymeter scale as well. So we've got a lot of shared codes between the two brands. And I think fundamentally it comes down to the fact that we were both creating products for purpose. We weren't creating things just as design objects. It was really functioning, dictating form. And probably it was accidental, maybe it was consumer taste, I'm not sure, but the fact that even when we had no official relationship together in the 60s and 70s, we're still coming to the same conclusion. Same as the Carrera name, same as uh, the Tag Turbo stories from the 1980s, uh, Joe Siffert being a friend between both brands, Steve McQueen, uh, Derek Bell. There was so, it, it feels that we're so grounded together that we were growing from the same seed and one went into cars and one went into watches that... It, and you enjoyed both like equally, so it must have been a pretty fun project to work on on your end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, of course, we're providing the watch as the foundation, but to have some communication between our design teams and the Porsche design teams and have these briefings together, um, it's, it's really, really powerful. And so now, of all the different watch projects you've been working on, what if you were to pick one favorite watch, what, which one would that be? Um, it's a hard and stupid question at the same time. No, no, like no, no. I mean, uh, there, there's one that's coming, um, which has just been uh, a wonderful, wonderful experience so far. I'm very lucky to work quite closely with Carol Casapi on some of these small projects, the uh, the queen of tourbillons. She hates of being course. called that, but she's an <laughs> she absolute legend is. within the industry. Yeah. And it's just such an immense privilege uh, for me to share so much time with her that uh, we're working towards Only Watch 2023. And for me, this is... Uh, uh, I mean, the world will see it the 1st of July next year, I think, if uh, it's the same format as usual. But this is something really uh, very, very special. Uh, you know, the development cycles for watches is so long. Yeah, it's true. Uh, when I joined the company March last year, a lot of the roadmap for the following two years had kind of been dictated. But with Only Watch, we can operate as a very small team and create something that's really outside the traditional sphere of, uh, of what the brand would produce. So, uh, yeah. Because, I mean, I guess lastly, uh, obviously when you think Taguer and when you think about the heritage, like you, you just did last May, um, um, the, the, the original um, Grand Prix and then you had the regular one. Yeah. Like you have so much and the brand has so much heritage, so much story, so much, like it's such an iconic brand that, I mean, sky's the limit when it comes to, to stories and sure. products. and, and I guess my last question would be, where do you start? Like, how do you pick which which portion, what year you decide to put your your, your pencil on and say, okay, we're gonna work around that year, that project, that ambassador, that... Yeah. How do you get to decide that? Um, if you were the one deciding <laughs> it. <laughs> I mean, I, I often say, Heritage is a bit of a double-edged sword because it's wonderful to have this amazing archive of things to, to draw from but at the same time, it can 
burden you and restrict your decision making process. To, so to find some balance between, the, and, you know, the, the example I often give is uh, Jean uh, Fabrique du Temps, Louis Vuitton. You know, Louis Vuitton has a very short timeline within the watchmaking industry. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you don't have any framework or, you know, icons that you have to respect and treat with such mm -hmm. reverence. Whereas for us at Tag Heuer, we have the Carrera and we have the Monaco. We have all of this history going back to the beginning of the creation of those products. The question is, what do you select from that lineage to continue into the future to be able to create avant-garde products that appeal to a broad consumer base? And I think when you look at these objects, you can really understand, again, you know, what is the DNA of these things? Mm. What is the, the kind of foundational philosophies? And with the Carrera, we can see the facet lugs, Jack's pursuit of legibility, uh, the fact that it was slightly more elegant, it could come on a strap or a bracelet, uh, we could have a gold case, we could have a steel case, but fundamentally it's about utilitarian and performant timekeeping. Uh, we can take these ingredients and push them further into the future. So I think it's, it's more the, the broader sense. Um, it's nice for us to take little codes like mm -hmm. the red of the tachymeds or the, the blue of the pulsation and carry this forward. Um, but I really think we have to understand the foundation of the product before we we take these little bits. <laughs> and in, in, in your opinion, like with what's happening right now in the watch industry, how do you think the evolution in collectors' mindset and in basically investment-wise, because mm. now a lot of people are wrongly thinking about watching, about buying a watch into investing into a watch, which yeah. is something completely different. Mm -hmm. Yet, right now that's what the trend is about. And how do you think the evolution of the mind can change or will change um, towards what brands are launching product-wise and how they're imagining in their collections. Yeah, I, I think we all know that this speculative aspect of the watch market has not been beneficial for the marketplace. It's caused a huge amount of problems. I mean, we were speaking just before we started about yeah. the difficulties in allocations and securing hot commodity pieces, particularly for passionate collectors that want to acquire this object because they love what it represents regarding savoir-faire or the storytelling of a brand mm -hmm. or the history when you've got these guys wading into the marketplace who have made huge amounts of money from crypto or whatever it might have been and have no understanding of what these things are but they just want to flex on their friends and post something to Instagram, it's not good and a lot of these people will disappear quite quickly as the market turns. We've already seen it in some areas mm -hmm. as uh, hot commodity pieces uh, that sure remain nameless have gone from fifty or sixty thousand dollars to $30,000, okay, it's still higher than its original retail price, but it's still a significant drop. Down. And that change in direction, I think will, uh, you know, give a cleansing uh, experience to the marketplace. I hope so anyway, um, but, but let's see what the future holds. The challenge is, is as a brand, how can you fix this? Do you produce more watches? Well, there's not some magic button that you no. can push because these are fine mechanical objects that take you know, dozens of pairs of hands and hundreds or thousands of hours to produce. Uh, and people don't understand that because watches have become a hot no. topic the same way that a couple of years ago in like at dinners you talk about investing in art or in wine or in real estate or in cars. Now it's just like the new topic and it's ours, it's watches, but it's not because there's more people interested in watches that we're going to be able to produce more watches. Nope. So. And I, I think when you come from technology or wine and spirits or fashion or cosmetics, or whatever it might be, you've only got a very small number of components to bring together. And often it's very industrialized, so it's quite straightforward. When you're developing a new watch, uh, it, it's the same as a car. You know, your timelines are huge because you have so many different components. You're often negotiating with, you know, dozens of suppliers and partners. Uh, with a collaboration product, you've got another uh, game at the table. What does the marketing team want to do? What does the development team want to do? What does the product team want to do? What does the commercial team want to do? You know, you have all of these different people. And you still have the of the brand that you really need to stick to when it comes to the different goals that you need yeah. to respect. And it, everything's a bit of a compromise and a bit of a balancing act, and it's really drawing all of these things together. So, it's like in a relationship. It, sure. <laughs> you need yeah. to. Magic Juggle recipe. some balls and uh, exactly. try and keep everything in the air and uh, exactly. try not to drop anything. So, yeah, I'm, let's see what the future holds if there's a, a broader economic downturn and uh, the market's changed. Well, they've already been quite depressed. Uh, but if these other asset classes start seeing a cooling off, uh, yeah, hopefully it will bring a kind of corrective force to the marketplace. Luckily for us as a Tag Heuer, we've had a few models that have been picked up in this kind of frenzy. Mm -hmm. 
um, but not uh, the vast majority of our product portfolio. And I, I love the fact that we're an egalitarian brand where you can walk into your local retailer and, and buy an Acura Racer or a Formula One or a Carrera. We're not really about, well, we don't do it at all. We don't have any artificial scarcity and it's really about being a much more open and uh, accessible brand. And I think it's not always the case for, for some other players in the marketplace. Well, good luck with that and, good, and congratulations on everything that you've been able to achieve in such a short period of time considering what's happening. Thank you very much for your time um, and good luck for the rest of the trip, trips, yeah. travel and, yeah. and ongoing projects. Great. Well, thank you for having me. It's really uh, a pleasure to talk as always. You're welcome.